Before the sermon, I want to tell all of our school families present here in this Lutheran Schools Week what a joy it is for us to have your children and your grandchildren here in five days a week, and uh, we miss them when they're not here because they bring so much energy and so many gifts to this place, and it's a blessing to learn together what it means to follow Jesus in our community and the world. And the Ascension staff and congregation want to take time to to thank our principal, Karen Jonas, our, our preschool early childhood center director, Pam Musburger, all the teachers, the staff, for your amazing work that you do every day. We give God thanks for you and you are in our constant prayers. And we want to invite everyone to our annual dinner and auction event, Saturday, March 24th in Camarillo. It is always a very fun event. It's always a great event. And now to the sermon. I've been a pastor for 35 years, and it's about time that I finally preach on this text. <laughs> it's not an easy one, but sometimes the difficult texts are the ones I think that we can grow the most. Our Gospel reading from John 2 brings up the uncomfortable subject of anger. Do you ever get angry? Or maybe I should say, when you get angry, how do you deal with it? Do you try to suppress it, hoping it will go away? Because after all, Christians are nice people. Or do you take it out on someone other than the reason of your anger? Some people take their anger at work out on their families. Or the opposite, they take their anger at family out at co-workers. Or do you turn anger inward on yourself? Psychologists tell us that's, that's one way that we can develop depression in our lives is when we don't express our anger and we internalize it, and then it could become depression. Then again, if we do express our anger, and if it's not done in a healthy way, it can be very damaging and destructive to others, especially those that we love the most. Meanwhile, if it's something big that fuels your anger, and I mean big things that we probably need to be angry about, severe hunger, poverty, violence, racism, sexism, discrimination and prejudice of any kind, what's going on now in Syria, or denial and refusal to care for God's creation, it's hard to know how to deal with those very big issues when it comes to anger. Today we can do one simple thing and do the crop walk at CLU. In your newsletter, our Global Ministries team put this page together in our responses to hunger. They did this as a response to the Mazone hunger truck that we had here a couple weeks ago. I invite you to take this and look at the ways that we can respond to the needs of those who are hungry, locally and globally. So if you're scared of your own, our own anger, how do we deal with Jesus who is angry? Our story today is Jesus in the temple. With a whip in his hand, turning over the tables, driving out the money changers, even the sheep and the cattle. The story would suggest that there is a time and a place and an action that's appropriate, at least for Jesus, to express anger. And I love the Gospel of John for how it, how it expresses both Jesus' divinity and Jesus' humanity. Jesus is 100% divine and 100% human, with, yet without sin. And I put this photo in because it's school's week here. <laughs> The story from John 2 must have been one of the most important stories in Jesus' life for the early church because it's one of a handful of stories that is told in all four Gospels. That makes for a fascinating Bible study separate from this sermon time. But here in John's Gospel, it's, it's near the beginning of Jesus' ministry. In chapter 1, Jesus had gathered his disciples. At the beginning of our chapter 2, Jesus takes them to a wedding in Cana, where he turns water into wine, and then goes on a road pilgrimage trip from the north to Capernaum to the south to Jerusalem. They're going to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, 
the greatest festival and story in the Old Testament, commemorating Israel's freedom from Egypt and the exodus into the Promised Land. The Passover festival remembers the God who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. And the Bible repeats that particular verse often, telling us that God is slow to anger. So why is Jesus so angry in today's story? John literally has Jesus walking in with a whip of cords, all Indiana Jones style, ready to administer some justice. Verse 16, he told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here, stop making my father's house a marketplace. The word marketplace is the word from which we get our word emporium. It's the same word in Greek. Eugene Peterson in the message translates it this way. Jesus put together a whip out of strips of leather and chased them out of the temple, stampeding the sheep and cattle, upending the tables of the loan sharks, spilling coins left and right. He told the dove merchants, get your things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a shopping mall. Mark's story, if we were reading that one, we would read something a little different. He, he had, Mark quotes uh, a couple Old Testament passages in Mark 11, where Jesus says, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples, or all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. John's Gospel quotes another Old Testament verse from Psalm 69, when he says, Zeal for your house will consume me. What is zeal? For Jesus it is passion. It is anger that is righteous. It is anger that is right. Jesus was zealous about his heavenly Father's house, about the temple, the place where God is worshipped. So why was Jesus angry and zealous? He was cleansing the temple. He was protecting true worship from the corrupting influence of consumerism. Some see Jesus was angry at the burdensome sacrificial system for those who were poor. Or maybe he was driving out the money changers from the outer courtyard, the courtyard of the Gentiles, because they were preventing the Gentiles from prayer in the temple. Jesus will not accept temple business as usual if it denies access of God's grace for the poor and for the marginalized. Maybe this whole event was about reopening the temple to the poor, to the foreigners, to the outcasts of Israel. That would fit Jesus' overall message through his words and his deeds. Martin Luther got angry too, didn't he? He got angry and he shook up the status quo, the powers that be, when the access to God's grace and mercy was turned into a financial tra transaction. And in those days, there was a famous line that you probably remember from Reformation sermons. As soon as the coin in the coffer, that is the offering plate, rings, the soul from purgatory springs. <laughs> and so Luther was speaking truth to power, confrontationally, directly, and prophetically. Today's story, Jesus is speaking truth to power. He is demonstrating yet powerfully, confrontationally, directly, and prophetically in the sense that the people were asking Jesus in verse 18, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus, in responding to their questions about this, answers them with this riddle. Verse 19, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The leaders say that the temple has been under construction for 46 years. That's a long building project. How could Jesus possibly raise it in three days? But Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. This is where God dwells. This is where we worship. All these animals crowding out the temple worshipers will no longer be needed for sacrifice. For Jesus is offering himself as the new temple, the place of, for meeting God, and also the way where we are finally reconciled with God. According to John's Gospel, it's at a future Passover, later on in the Gospel of John, 
At just the hour where the, they were going to slaughter the Passover lamb, the Holy Lamb of God is crucified. So in retrospect, and only in retrospect, after Jesus' resurrection on Easter morning, they figured out what Jesus meant by this. We read in verse 22. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So let's return to this subject of anger. What might Jesus' expression of God's righteous anger teach us about appropriate expression of anger? So often anger involves an outburst, and the wrong time, and the wrong place, and the wrong way. Whereas we could suggest there may be a time and a place for acting out of anger that is fitting and fruitful and God-given. And the timing of anger? Remember, God is slow of anger. And the book of James tells us that we are to be slow to anger. The imagery in the letter of James is that of bridling a horse, that is, exercising restraint and learning discipline. God's anger comes not out of a place of urgent need or sudden pain, but of a consistent, constructive, longing compassion for, for all of us. So our own emotions of anger will need some sifting and sorting to recognize the misplaced anger, to sit patiently with any righteous anger that remains. And to sit with anger does not mean that we let it boil within us, but it means that we acknowledge it first and foremost with God, in raw honesty, and God can take it in the style of the Psalms of Lament, and then ask God these questions. Is this anger godly? That is, does it in some way reflect God's character? Does the anger reflect Jesus' compassion? Does it spring from our love for the other person, for the love of God's whole creation, for the fullness of God's kingdom? God is not full of anger, but God is full of love and compassion and grace and mercy. Jesus chose a strategic place to express his anger. It was in the religious headquarters where the powers that be in Jerusalem had held their grip. Likewise, we all need to speak truth to power. And I don't presume to tell any of you how to overturn the tables. But this is what it means for me. An example of that in recent weeks has been the students in Florida who are angry over the death of their classmates. They are demanding change. They are speaking to those in power, demanding we change how we do things. Those student voices and their righteous anger are giving many hope that something will change. In God's compassion and zeal for you and for me, God the Father sent His only begotten Son. And in, the, in holy baptism, Jesus entered into the temple of your body and drove out the sin in us, not with a whip of cords, but with His word of forgiveness and water. And He washed you clean. He made you holy. He made you righteous before God. And so now when God sees each of us, he doesn't see our sin, but he sees the perfect righteous life of Christ, our Savior. Twice in our text, we hear that the disciples remembered the scriptures, they remembered Jesus' words, and they believed. That theme is constant in John's Gospel. May we too remember the words of scripture and Jesus' words and believe and trust him. If, or should I say when, when you find yourself with the gift of righteous anger, first acknowledge it before God. Seek the right time and the right place where it might turn to action for change, for ushering in God's kingdom of justice and peace. We close the sermon with this three-part Franciscan blessing. I'll read the top line, and if you're able to read the screen, I invite you to read the response. May God bless you with anger. 